Yeah. concentrates on the uh, lamb and or you know the burnt offering that he does and nobody under nobody really goes for the piece of um, what was the real problem the real problem was he, he was given a commandment to be the king of Israel and is he acting as the king no he's not acting as the king so you know when that's the problem everybody thinks he's usurping the priest's office or something like that uh, you know and uh, and Samuel comes and he's he, what it is is that's like the last straw you know I mean that's the straw that breaks the back of the camel and uh, but he hasn't done anything in two years uh, to get this going and, and 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 it's just been it's just been a mess and it's been allowing others to um, to get stronger we know the Ammonites he, he got up for the Ammonites. He got up for the, um, now he's got the Philistines coming after him. And uh, uh, let's look into chapter 14. The Bible says, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, uh, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side, but he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh wearing an, an ephod and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you. We ask you, Lord, to bless the time and also, Lord, uh, bless our walk through this. It's a long chapter, Lord, so I pray that you uh, walk us through it, Lord Father, and get us the understanding we need from it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, He's, uh, there's a zealous, uh, uh, Jonathan, we're going to see a difference between two men, okay? First man is a man of faith, and the uh, next man, of course, is a, is a, is a man of weakness uh, or a man of fear. 
okay? And we must remember whenever this starts that how many, uh, how many weapons are being made in Israel at this time? None. There's no blacksmiths. Remember, the Philistines took all the blacksmiths out, and we've had two years, and he hasn't gotten any others. I mean, it's like a welder. you got a welder. Oh, we need a welder. We need a welder. You need a welder for two years. How come you haven't found one? Uh, why haven't you taken somebody down and trained them to be a welder? Uh, why haven't you trained any blacksmiths? I mean, you had two years to do this. We need a war economy in some way. Uh, you do realize that when Solomon took over, Solomon uh, does his money, the, the major part of the money of a government should take care of two things. Government should not take care of anything else. Amen. And those two things are defend your country, okay, and police your country. That's all that you do. A government was made in the very beginning to do what? Kill, kill people that murder people. That's what they're for. Amen? They're not there to uh, be an accountant or anything else, uh, you know, all those other things. And that's why countries will go down, go down to the ground is because government is a hammer. It's a destroyer of things. So when you put them in charge of something, what does it do? It destroys it. If you don't do it right, God said, this is what I made it for. If you're not going to do those things with it, guess what? It's not going to work too well. Amen? And, uh, but Jonathan, he's zealous. He, he sees the situation. He says, hey, look, I, I've got to go up there and look at the situation. What he's going to do is, he's going to do what we call leaders recon. Okay? He's not just going, hey, we're going to win. We're going to go up there. That would be a suicide mission. So what he's saying is, I need to see this with my eyes. So he grabs his armor bearer, and that's what a leader needs to do. A leader needs to go out there and see the battlefield for himself. Okay? Uh, you won't hear many people preach this, and the reason why is because they've never done it. The other thing is, our leaders today, people who have been in the army, now they have leaders who do not do recons. They do not lead from the front. They lead from the television. Our leaders today watch television, and uh, they do slideshows, and, and you've got to understand, I've been in these meetings. They don't say anything negative, and if you say something negative, you will not speak in the next meeting. Our leaders have no idea what's going on. I have watched it. I have seen it. Uh, it's something that is pretty disgusting, because now look at what we're dealing with, and look who we have as our joint chief of staff. He's a loser. Sorry. Well, Jonathan, Jonathan is very zealous. He says he wants to do it, and he didn't tell his father. I think the reason why his father being a procrastinator probably would have said, no, no, I don't want you to do it. This is a needed thing. So it says in the second part, it says it's Saul. Now watch how the difference is. He goes forward to see what's in front of him. Saul tarries in the uttermost part of Gibeah, which is south of there, under a pomegranate tree, which is in the groan, and, and look what he has with him. He's got 600 men. Now, this is what most people would say. Go back to 13, and I think it's verse number 2. And at the beginning it says, Saul chose him out. How many men? 3,000. 3, okay? Uh, 3,000 men. Now, 3,000 men, choice men of that size, he has working for him. He's going to attack with it, with the Ammonites. Now he's against the Philistine larger army, and he's got 600 men, but that's not talking that he has less people and people have left him. What, the, what it is is he's got 600 men, and they are his like his headquarters. Okay, He's got a, a, a what do they call it, Prole uh, I can't remember what the, like the Secret Service type guard, those guards that are for yourself, he's got a huge staff now. He, he's, he, you got to understand, he's a man of, he's, he's pretty much a man of fear. He likes to be a, 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 a armchair quarterback in this situation. Obviously, he's not going forward, okay? He's got 600 men, and they're all around him. And verse number three, and Ahia, the son of Ahitu, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, uh, the Lord's priest in, in uh, Shiloh, wearing an ephod, uh, and the people knew not that Jonathan was going. But he, here he is. He has the uh, priest out there. And if we remember, the guy who we're looking at is, uh, was a guy named Phinehas, who was one of Eli's sons. Uh, what were they? They're hirelings. 
So you got a hireling type of priest. So not only does he have 600 people surrounding him to uh, protect him, he, he's got his priest there too. And his little, his little subject. Why? Well, you know, I'm not need that guy. You know, I mean, they need a fast prayer or something like that. Something like that. I need him. A good luck charm, pretty much, out there. Uh, and they didn't even know that Jonathan was gone. Um, and uh, now, in verse number four, it says, And between the passage by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. The name of the one was Moses, and the other was Sina. Moses is the shining heights, and Sina is the pointed rock, okay? So you're going to have a two-piece, uh, pointed, two pointed rocks, and there's a pass, okay? So I went and looked it up, and uh, there I saw the point. Uh, what you're having is, this is what it looks like. It's going to look like as if you put two pieces just like that. And this is one road. Look, this is huge. I, I mean, this road would be about like that. Nothing to it. And the, that's the only air in between is this road that they have. Now, Jonathan sees something, and what he saw from a distance was, you get up close to something, and he started to see the opening. And what he's seeing is, he. anybody here remember uh, the movie The 300? Thermopylae in Thermopylae, they saw a pass, and that pass was covered, and it only was covered by 300 men. They were able to destroy like a division during that time to, to protect that. What he's saying is there's a, there's only a little way through here. So uh, what he what they have is they have this place uh, set up that they have forces around here to keep uh, people from there. Why? Because if you get through here, it's a clear sail. It's a clear sail north because right now uh, the Philistines are moving, and of course they're moving towards a Gilgal again. Now, why I told you about Gilgal, it's a tactical assembly area. If you haven't noticed it yet, where'd the Ammonites go for? Gilgal. Where do the Philistines now go for? Gilgal. Why Gilgal? It's weapons. That's the only place they have their, that's their like fort, their tactical area, their gathering area. Uh, that's an important area. If they lose that, obviously, uh, there's going to be a problem they're going to lose. Philistines are actually from this area over here. Why are they coming all the way over here? Because they know the importance of this. And they're dividing up the country because this will divide north to south, and they'll lose the communication between those. If you take Gilgal, and break this country up like that, you're breaking it up north to south. And if you'll notice, that's how it broke up in naturally. The, the north, northern tribes left, and it split right there, almost about right there. Amen. So, verse number, uh, verse number five, the forefront of one was situated... Uh, northward over against Michmash and the other southward uh, over against Gibeah. Okay, the highlands, they got the highlands over there uh, that they're working on in Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over unto the uh, garrison of these uncircumcised, okay, these people that don't have a covenant with God. Let's go over there. It may be. The Lord will work for us. I don't think he's trying to say uh, God's employed, you know, working for us. Like I brought it up with other people. Well, let's say a prayer. We'll get God working for us. He, he's actually looking a different way at this. Maybe the Lord will help us out and we'll be in his will. We are, uh, we are, you have to understand the reason why he says uncircumcised. We are God's people. Maybe God will, will, will look favorably to us. So, it, and he says that, he says, um, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. So he states and he knows God and he says, you know, uh, it, it, there's no restraint to God. God can win no matter what, obviously. Amen. Uh, people think God, people think most of the time God's a dope and he won't do anything. This is too much for him. You have to understand something. Uh, 
Maybe, nobody thinks about this. Maybe it's just too little for God. He built the whole universe. What's a little pass? No big deal, you know? Amen. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to uh, thy heart. Then said Jonathan, here's the plan. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. Obviously, they're going to go uphill. Um, but if they say thus, Come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. So he's, uh, we would think he's throwing out a fleece, but what he's really, we're going to go on, I'm going to show you what he's doing here in a little bit. Okay. Um, he says in 11, but both of them, dis but, and both of them discovered themselves. They, they started waving unto the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come out forth out of their holes uh, where they had hid themselves. So that makes it easier. Mostly before a battle, what usually happens? Uh, a few guys, they, they usually have a meeting, and uh, a guy will say, This is what I'll do if you don't make a battle here. I'll give you this, give you that. You go back home, you pay us tribute, or something like that. That has not happened. Uh, they're not going to surrender anyway. Okay, so what they're looking at is these two guys. Now, think about this. They're in a hole. They don't know it's Jonathan. I bet you Jonathan probably clothed down for this. And then all of a sudden, they get up. And uh, they start going like this. And you know what the other guys say? Hey, look, they're leaving their holes. What's that? They're, they're afraid. They know there's no way to win. Uh, we took their weapons away, so obviously they can't fight. Uh, they, they're coming over. Uh, they're, they're surrendering. That's what they're looking at. Let's see what they'll say. And this is what happens. He says, And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Now on the spiritual side of the house, you usually will have a, you know, you, you, you go out and you go into a war of witnessing or whatever you want to do, and you go out, and uh, I don't know how many of you have dealt with this, but you get a, like you'll bang on a few doors or, or go meet people when I was street preaching. I used to meet a lot of, uh, I used to meet a lot of uh, what, what they call, uh, uh, one of the people that baptize for, the Church of Christ. I meet a lot of those people. Usually, they, they don't know much Bible. Very, very. Um, they're very direct, but they don't know any Bible. Um, but uh, I have them, and then you'll get some Jehovah Witnesses. Now they think they have the upper hand. Yeah, come on over. Come on over. We'll show you a thing. Yeah, I'll bring my Bible over. It's really not much of a contest. You start getting them all uh, disarrayed. You know, uh, they don't know much Bible. You start opening up the Bible. Uh, they think they know it in the beginning. They give you a few verses out of context. Next thing you know, they're wondering what's going on because they just fought the wrong battle, basically. Amen. You've ever had that? It's pretty easy, isn't it? I mean, they don't know enough Bible to even combat any of you. So anyway, they say, come on up in over here. Come on up. And Jonathan says, the Lord hath delivered them uh, into our hand. Uh, Jonathan took a chance. He has a, he looks to the Lord. He, he's looking to the Lord. And he says he's a man of faith. And he says, I'm going to take a chance at this. Now, remember, Jonathan is a leader. He saw, he's, he's a commander in this thing. He's probably, the army is split, and he's got part of it, a, a good section of his command, and he's doing the, no different than Stonewall Jackson did, uh, is go forward. Now, it didn't work out for Jackson uh, in Chancellorsville because he came back, and what happened? He got shot by his own people. Well, Jonathan, he's going to take his armor bearer. He's going to go out there and... He's seeing the, the area and he says, man, look at that pass. i got to have that pass. If we get that pass, we if we get through that pass, this is over. But think about this. If they get through this pass, then we got the problem. Okay? So this pass is, is like 
Gettysburg. What's that? It's a very important place right now. Uh, a lot of people, it's a place where you can easily defend. It's very high up. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be, you can see the whole area uh, from there. Uh, so Jonathan, it says, and Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and his uh, feet. So he starts to climb up there, and his armor bearer is coming after him. And, uh, and then they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. They got up there. Uh, they saw they, they were calmed down, or they weren't, uh, they weren't in fighting mode. And you know what happened? They tear into them. They start taking, taking and putting their weapons to them, and it says how many? Twenty. Just so you know, that's that's incredible for two guys. That's pretty incredible for two men to, to win and, and take twenty men. It says the first slaughter, the first slaughter, uh, and his which Jonathan his armor bearer made. It was about twenty men, with, within as it were, and half acre of land. Now watch. God's actually defined something for you, brother Larry. I don't know if you picked up on it. Look down there and he says, he says, within as it were an half acre of land, look at the next part, which a yoke of oxen, what, by plow. So uh, a half acre is how many a yoke of oxen, too. That's four, four ox to a half acre. So if you were to go by acre, how many oxen would you have? You'd have eight. Okay, the reason that's that that could be uh, important is now you know how many uh, how much land Job would have with all his oxen, and you would start to realize how many how many how much land certain men had because of how many oxen they had. You see, it's not as you know. It it, it kind of helps you in your Bible reading, uh, verse number uh, fifteen. And there was a trembling in the host. There was a trembling in the host and in the field and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, uh, they also trembled and the earth quaked, so it was a very great trembling. And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went on beating, beating down uh, one another. I mean, now all of a sudden, Jonathan has has made an uproar. He now has the pass. They have no idea what has happened, but tw they know one thing. Their little group that they had to, to secure that is not there no more. So you know what's going to happen? They're going to get very upset. Why? We have our back doors open now. And our, our, our continual movement is what? Our momentum is now stopped. We get going forward, and uh, they they start uh, they start getting a little bit uh, temp temptuous uh, temptuous here. Uh, the battle order is now disarrayed, and what else happens? They have an earthquake. I mean, just just now, a natural disaster just comes in. Hey, if anything can't get bad, it just uh, just gets even worse, you know? It's like, hey, I'm stuck on the road. I'm out on my motorcycle. It's just been raining. It's been a bad day. I don't have any overpass or anything. And guess what? Now it just doesn't rain. Now it's got hail coming down. This is a great day, isn't it? <coughs> it stinks to have hail come down on you when you're on the motorcycle. But if it can't get any worse, well, just what? It just got worse. And now... Uh, it's now, it's now, uh, an earthquake's coming. The people are starting to move, uh, starting to get a little bit frantic. And it says the watchmen saw all this, and what happened? They started beating, beating down uh, one another. Okay, uh, what, what can you relate to that spiritually? Okay, I've been to places where, uh, you know, you start to, you start to talk to people, you start to debate. And you've got, they got a group, and I've done this before. All of a sudden, you take out their leaders, and it's really easy. They don't know any Bible. You start taking out their leaders. What happens to the other people? They start getting involved. What are they doing? They start arguing with each other. Well, I don't think this. I don't think. Remember this happened. Uh, go to the book of Acts. Acts 23. Acts 23.
You ever see a basketball game and all of a sudden the team's getting is losing and that they, whatever they do doesn't go right or whatever. And what do they start doing? They argue amongst each other. That's what's happening with this army. They start fighting amongst themselves. Look at verse number uh, six. Paul. Paul's fighting. Uh, he was he was uh, talking to the men at, in Acts. He was given this given a. Uh, over and they, they, he, he brings up something and then all of a sudden there's two 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 different uh, people that are there, two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, and But when Paul, verse 6, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees cried out in the council, men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the re and resurrection of the dead, am I, I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but Pharisees confess both. Uh, see, they had a common enemy. But you have to understand, now that common enemy is, is now uh, the victor of one side. What do you, what, now they start fighting with each other. He's now, you've got, you've got a problem. What happens? Things aren't going so good. Well, we're going to start arguing about amongst ourselves now. You know, I, I, I watch this at an organizations and even, they, they, all of a sudden it starts to go bad. What happens? They start arguing amongst themselves. When business shares, when those businesses are going down, like these guys like Bud Light and all that, what do you think they're doing in their boardrooms right now? They're making a mess. Why? They're all arguing amongst themselves. Nobody's, nobody's thinking uh, together. So uh, a, a company divided by themselves, what? It's not going to fall. It's not going to. It's not going to. Not going to prosper. Amen. It shall fall. So they start fighting with each other in here, not getting anything uh, done. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, "Number now, get up, number now, and see who is gone from us. We need to figure out what's going on now. We got we got problems here." And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. They're not there. And, uh, and so uh, Saul uh, said unto Ahia, Bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at the time with the children of Israel. And who just learned something from Eli's kids? Saul, what's that? Let's get the, let's get the God, good luck charm out here. Oh, we got we got to get the ark up here. Why? Well, we we got to get the banner up. You know, it's important to have that thing up here. We got to get that thing up here uh, because you know it's it's our order of battle. We take that thing in there and we'll win. You know, you don't change your socks in the middle of the World Series, my friend. I got my lucky rabbit's foot right here. Okay, let me get up to to the plate. You know, tic tac toe, three in a row. That works. Toink. When he strikes out, does he blame God? Good luck charm don't work. So Saul, right away, he, he starts acting again. He's got a character about him. Uh, he likes to he likes to he likes to be heard and said, but he doesn't like to be in the action. He likes to be a a a, a, a lounge chair quarterback, I guess. And Saul said unto Ohio, bring here the ark. Bring here the ark. Verse 19, and it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, Withdraw thine hand. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves. You know what that tells you? They weren't ready. Now all of a sudden they have to assemble themselves. What's, do you realize that there's now a battle there? They're hearing things. And they haven't even gotten up and did stand two yet. They're still back there. They ain't even ready. You aren't even at your gun yet. So as he turns around, he says, they're not even ready. Let's get up. Did you notice another thing about this? Bring the ark. We got to do prayer and everything else. But guess what? Now all of a sudden, we hey, wait a second. I see opportunity here. Ah, get God out of here. We can do this ourselves. Prayer comes second, you know. Winning comes first.
So they assembled themselves together, and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a great discomfiture. They looked over, and they're seeing what they're seeing. Uh, moreover, the Hebrews that were uh, with the Philistines. Here, here you go. The, the Hebrews that were with, notice how it's saying, with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about. Even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. Okay, um, these people that are uh, inside there, uh, they were taken over for a while, and guess what? Now they see everything's happening. There are also some people that were probably uh, paying tribute over to the Philistines, working for them, and now all of a sudden they see what's happening, and what do they do? They jump sides. You ever see somebody that uh, jumps sides? We, we saw them when we were young. Uh, it's like the Super Bowl. You watch the first half, and they got like a Green Bay Packers shirt on. Uh, all of a sudden, the second half comes, and, and the Miami Dolphins are winning, and they got a Miami Dolphins shirt on. You know? You ever see people that pick the winner in the second half of the Super Bowl, you might as well say? No? They get on the bandwagon. So these people that are in there, they're starting to get on to the bandwagon here. And verse 22, likewise, all the men of Israel, which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in, in the battle. I mean, everyone's starting to get in on this. Hey, let's get in on this, man. Hey, you know, this, this is basically a movement now. Not only do you have an army fighting, trying to get on the inside, you've got inside people trying to, trying to get into the fight now. Okay, making a big disarray here. Uh, the Philistines, i got to say it like this, man. The Philistines, they sure are getting messed up. You see? They don't know where it's all coming from. You know, see what can happen when you lose something that's very important? And that was very important, that pass. Now Saul's ready. He's got all his people. And look what it says in 23. It means nothing about Saul. It says, so the Lord. That We could just stop right here. So the Lord saved Israel that day. He's the real hero here. Is the Lord. Why? Saul's already messed up. You know, the Lord's used. The, the Saul's going to look good in this. But you have to understand something. He's in disarray. Saul doesn't, doesn't have the, he doesn't have the great ability of leading. He hasn't even gotten his men together. Uh, let me tell you, it would have to take the Lord with a man like him. He can't get his people up. He doesn't have an eye for this. He needs, he needs constant counsel, you know, with him. Okay, and it says, And the battle passed over unto uh, Beth Haven. It, it passes over towards, it's starting to go back towards the med there, uh, towards that way. And the men of Israel were distressed that day. They were distressed that day, for Saul adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening. He, he turns around and called for a, a fast here. Uh, i got to tell you this. That's a foolish oath. This is a foolish oath. See, this is an oath where, where he's trying to say, "Let's Okay, we're going to get spiritual now. Okay, I see this at meetings, just so you know. Guys who have meetings and stuff. Uh, a church is going to have a meeting. We're going to call for a 24-hour fast for the whole church. Uh, you don't even realize something. God calls. God's the one that leads in the fasts. Okay? I always say it like this. Fasting is extra credit. You do it if you want. If I call, usually when I, I have called a church fast, but um, I, I'm not expecting, you don't have to. I, I mean, I will. But you don't have to, okay? But I'd like to see it happen. Uh, you know, we haven't really, we've only done it once, just so you know. But um, he, he calls a fast here. But he doesn't think about this. He's obviously not been a leader in the military long uh, because soldiers fight on three things. And we know those three things are always this. they they got to have beans, they got to have bullets, and they got to have bandages. You've got to have these things to fight. Uh, they, you can't fight on an empty stomach. It's just not going to work. And, and you've got to realize another thing. 
if anybody here, you, Larry, you've been a soldier. Do you, when the battle comes, are you, you going to be, uh, you're going to be Mr. Joe Pro Christian, or are you going to be Mr. I'm going to kill somebody? Makes you think, doesn't it? The iniquity in the head going to battle is not a good idea. You know, I think I, I can guarantee you when the battle starts and they start fighting, and this, they don't have long-range weapons here. I can guarantee you nobody's walking into it like this. So, now watch how Saul says this. So insecure here. He turns around tries to make a spiritual thing. Oh, we're going to have a religious session in here. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to look good in front of everybody. And he says that, now watch, that I, notice the I, may be avenged of who? Mine enemies. Right Wait a second, whose enemies are these? I thought this was the Lord's enemies. Why is he taking self-exaltation to these things? Israel is God's people. Uh, they're not Saul's enemies, they're God's enemies. Amen? This is, uh, we have to look to, we don't say, look, is this your church? No, it's not your church, it's God's church. You just call it your church and claim it, but it's not your church. It's not my church, it's God's church. And he'll do what he wants with it, okay? Uh, so none of the people tasted any food. So they're, they're afflicted here, okay? They're, they're, they're hungry. And they and over this oath, and it's not a good oath, it's a foolish oath. And all they, verse 25, and all they of the land came uh, to wood, and there was honey on the ground. Honey's a picture of what? Word of God? The Bible. God's words. Honey is a picture of God's words. So uh, he says, and when the people were come into the wood, that's the wooded area, behold, the honey dropped. Uh, do you realize that Israel is a land of what? Milk and honey, expect it, expect it. Uh, milk and honey, who makes milk? The cows make milk, the goats make milk. So what do you need for them? Grass. And this is a land of a lot of grass and garden and a lot of, and a lot of honey, okay? Um, and he says, behold, the honey dropped, but watch, but no man put his hand to his mouth for the people feared the oath. I mean, talk about uh, honey is a good food. Honey is a pure food. It's the one that you cannot uh, synthetically make. You cannot make honey. Honey is one is is a is if you want to uh, uh, keep from getting sick, what do you use honey? Honey's the best thing. The pollen from honey. The bees make it. It's the only way it can be made. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged. It's going to be ignorance here. But Jonathan he heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. Go to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24 and talking about honey, look at verse number 13. My son, eat thou honey. Why? Because it's good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul when thou hast found it. Then there shall be a reward, and thy expectations shall not be cut off. Okay, he says, look, honey's good. And he's showing this is the word of God. He says, you should be keeping this from, from your uh, soldiers here. They need to see. The spiritual soldiers need that honey. And here's Saul uh, keeping these things from his soldiers. Verse 28, then answered one of the people and said, thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Wouldn't that be a, what kind of curse is that? Curse be anyone who eat food. Curse, do you see those cursings in Deuteronomy 28? No, you don't see the types like that. I mean, this army needs, needs to have some type of sustenance. And here's the commander of all weakening his own army. You imagine what could have happened if he didn't weaken his army.
Then answered one of the people, Thy father straightly charged the people with the oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, My father had troubled the land. See, I pray you, how my eyes were enlightened because I tasted a little bit of this uh, honey. It needs a healthy army. How much more if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. And they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon. And the people were very uh, faint. Now this is one day. Now here's Gilgal. Uh, there's Michmash. And you know where they're getting them to? Back here. Uh, Ajalon's right about here in this area. Uh, that's a lot of area to cover. They've kicked them all the way back. Now Saul, Jonathan's here. He's cut off. Jonathan has now cut off their advance. They won't be going to Gilgal. Okay? Saul's coming this way. And the Philistines are running this way. Uh, it probably would have been better for Saul once they had gotten there. If he had gotten over to Ajalon, it would have been over. He had cut, cut off their retreat and there would have been uh, no way out. But he didn't cut off the retreat. You have to understand something. If you don't you don't kill the Philistines, they keep coming back. Is there anybody else that does that in the Bible? Amalek. Is there anybody else that does that in the Bible? It's called Satan. Okay? They, they just you know, keep pursuing, keep coming. Okay? Amalek, then came Amalek. We always see that Amalek keeps popping up. The Philistines are also like a spiritual enemy to the Jews. And they're going to keep popping up. They're going to keep popping up. So he takes them back to an area uh, called Ajalon, and Ajalon is uh, it's a hill where the Lord hides. And they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint, and the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them uh, on the ground and the people did eat them uh, with the blood. So right away now, this is what you got in your head. They they grab, start grabbing the spoil, and they start gutting them, and right there, and they just start eating them. Is that what you're thinking? Okay, it's an army. They started gathering them up, cutting them. They, they saw food, okay? Now they got food, the soldiers, what are they doing? They're doing a barbecue out there. But the difference now is, instead of being proper with you have to realize something, people. Uh, they would have. They, they don't eat with the blood. They they gut it, and then they have to have it. What we what we call what kosher, okay? They call it kosher like that. They're not going to cut it like that. They just start <coughs> cutting it up and putting it on the grill, and now they're starting to have a barbecue, okay? And uh, they're they're basically uh, going at it as much as they can. They're they're weak. They're they're trying to they're trying to get their substance back. They're doing it fast, so they're sinning. Uh, by eating the blood and Saul weakened the people and now what's happening is the people are stumbling into his sin. You know, you can actually, as a leader, you can make people sin. And people don't understand. Uh, uh, okay, uh, next week we'll be bring, bring, in, bring in the NIV. We'll be, we'll be, uh, I'll be preaching from the NIV next week. What do you think? You get what I'm saying? What would I be doing? Now I'd be causing the people to sin. Because now you have a different book. You don't have the real. You don't have the Bible in your hands. You don't have God's word. What happened? I took it away from you. Now you're doing what? You're sitting in ignorance if you don't know the difference. Amen. And uh, he so he's weak in them. Now they're stumbling. Then they told Saul, saying, "Behold, behold, the people sin against the Lord, in that they eat with the blood." And and he said. Ye have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. Oh my! He see he's dramatic. Have you noticed his dramatics are coming? He's a character. Okay, Saul is a is a character. He's a big guy, and he, he likes to do a lot of performance things. Uh, just so you know, uh, there are we've had generals that are very big, great performance guys. Uh, guy like uh, Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur. Uh, I, I remember Eisenhower. Uh, 
made a statement. Uh, what had happened was he was going to going to run for president, and Douglas MacArthur said he'll make a good president. He was the best clerk I ever had. Okay, he he worked for Douglas MacArthur underneath him, just so you know. And um, and they asked Eisenhower about what he said, and Eisenhower said it was a great job. I learned incredible dramatics. Douglas MacArthur was a dramatic. He was a um, Prima donna, they used to call him. Uh, and another one was Patton. Patton was a prima donna. Uh, he, Patton liked to get in front of his troops, and even though he wasn't doing those things, he would get in, his troop, in front of his troops and just say the weirdest things, and uh, like, you know, he wasn't afraid of anything, and that would charge up his, his, his men, okay? Not to mention, I mean, he put on a few displays inside of a hospital and smacked the kid in the head because uh, the kid wouldn't go forward. Uh, he wasn't good with um, he wasn't good with uh, what we call shell shock. Amen. And uh, verse number thirty-four. So Saul gets through his dramatics, and Saul said, "Disperse yourselves among the people, and say unto them, Bring me hither every man his ox and every man his sheep, and slay them here, and eat." and sin not against the Lord in eating with the blood. And all the people brought every man his ox with him that night and slew them there. Now watch. And Saul built an altar unto who? The Lord. The Lord. Now watch this. The same was the first altar. This is the first altar he ever makes. He makes this altar, then he built unto the Lord. This is the first one he makes. Now watch. And Saul said, let us go, uh, let us, let, he makes the altar, but what is it for? What is this altar for? Not for him. He's not going to confess his sin, if you haven't noticed it yet. He's making this for the sins of who? Others. A another thing. What's it costing him? Who's, who's, whose stuff is this? Is this his stuff? No, this is the spoil. See, he's not, he's not going to pay his own deal here. Remember what, remember what David said? It means nothing unless it what? It costs you something. Okay, your sacrifice has to cost something. Your, your worship has to cost something. God's very particular about worship. He said it's going to cost you something. It, it may cost you a 20-mile ride. It may cost you, it may cost you time. It's going to cost you something to do it, okay? It may cost you money. you got to pay for it. But it's going to cost you something. So Saul builds an altar for what? Other people's sins. Not his own. He's doing it for other people's sins. Now in 36... And Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and spoil them until the morning light. And let us not leave, leave a man of them. And they said, do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Then said the priest, let us draw a near hither unto, unto God. And Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But... He answered him not that day. Why? Why is that? He's an unrepentant man. If you hold iniquity in your heart, what happens? The Lord will not hear you. Okay? So he's not hearing Saul. And uh, and Saul's, he's got the Urim and the Thummim there, but nothing is going on. They're trying to get, uh, they're trying to get credit uh, for God's, uh, for, they're trying to take credit for God's battle here. Uh, it says, because he didn't answer them. And Saul said, Draw ye near hither, all the chief of the people, and know and see wherein this sin hath been uh, this day. He's going to try and look good. For as the Lord liveth, which save, saveth Israel, uh, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. You, you see how he makes the statement? He makes it, and he doesn't make it with knowledge. 
He doesn't understand what's been going on, so he just yells out there, hey, look, uh, uh, the sit between me and Jonathan are standing up. Whoever did this is going to die. Me and Jonathan are together on this. Man, even if it's Jonathan, he's going to die. Okay. This is going to backfire. From saying something like that. Uh, verse number, um, verse number uh, 38, 39. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among the people that answered him. Then said he unto all Israel, Be ye on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said unto Saul, Do what seemeth good unto thee. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, Give a perfect law. And Saul and Jonathan were taken. So when they did the lot between them and the people, Saul and Jonathan were one. I got to tell you something right now. I bet you Saul's knees start knocking. You got to realize something, man. The lot is of the Lord. The casting of the lot is, for, of, is of the Lord. And now all of a sudden, he turns around and he's figuring, me and Jonathan on this side, the people on that side, cast lot between us, and all of a sudden, his comes up. It's not the people, it's one of them. The only two of them are standing up there. Guess what? It's you or your son. One of you is going to die today. What'd you do, Saul? You made a bad move. You talk too much. You opened your mouth too wide. You said some things. Your acting is now a, a blank check that you that you can't pay. Amen. So, 40, uh, 41, Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God, give, give a perfect lot, and Saul, but the people escaped, excuse me, 42, and Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Wow. Now watch this. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what, what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I uh, did but taste a, a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand. And lo, uh, I must die. I guess, uh, you know, you know, Dad, if, uh, if that's what you called for and that's what the Lord wants and and you, you obviously seem like you know what God wants here. You're the leader. He picked you. I guess I'm going to die. I've done something wrong. Uh, I'm going to die. Remember uh, Jephthah's, da Jephthah's daughter? Well, you know, you, you, you've made the vow. You know, I guess I'm going to die. Okay? Uh, it's, it's odd when you, don't, when you don't do any reading. I mean, here's Jonathan. At least he's reading the book. He's a man of faith. Uh, he's a man of honor because of that faith. And now his father's in a straight, and, and Jonathan says, well, okay, I guess it's going to have to go. You know? Guess it's going to have to be this way. I took a little of that honey. Shoosh. And, then, uh, and Saul answered, God do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. This is... Uh, we have to understand something. This is Saul's command. This isn't God's command. God has nothing to do with any of this. Uh, go over to Psalm 64. Psalm see where it needs to be put. Uh, look at verse number <laughs> verse number six. They searched out iniquities. They accomplished a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly uh, shall they be wounded. Kind of like Ahab. So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon who? themselves. This ain't falling upon him. It's falling upon his son. 
his own tongue should swell upon himself. All that see them shall uh, flee away. And, and he's, he's making the wrong play right here. This is not God's command. This is Saul's command. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die? Who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he died not. I mean, why, why should he? He was, he was a man standing uh, for the Lord. He was a man that said, you know what? Okay, I, need, I see the camp. I see what's happening. You know what? i got to go without the camp. i got to go forward of the Lord. Saul's procrastinating back there. He's just showing a bit of force, but Saul isn't stopping anything. Okay, I, I would assume that the the Ammonites were obvious, seemed to be smaller army than these Philistines, and the reason why is because the Ammonites he just ran right into it, knowing he, he was going to uh, overcome. This time he's in a straight. This time he's got he's got so he had some problems. He didn't know what to do. They wrought a great victory because Jonathan went forward and took went forward with in God's stead. And saw some things and said, the Lord is going to win this battle, basically. And he went in forward, didn't care about what was going on, and, and he found a place for him. It went up, and the guys let him come up. And what does he do? He turned, they figure he's surrendering, and then all of a sudden he pulls out something. He starts slice. Just start fighting. You know, he was in the advantage right there when he got up there. Okay, verse number 46. Then Saul went up from following the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. So he, he backs off of them, and now the Philistines go. So Saul took the kingdom over, uh, over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side. Now watch this. Against Moab and against the children of Ammon, and against Edom, and against the king of Zobah. Now, I, I, I want you to look at just the, the, the main ones, the Moab, the Ammon, and the Edom, and take the first two letters out of uh, Moab, M-O. Then look at A-M for Ammon, Moab, and look at the last against Edom, E-D, Moab what? Mohammed. Isn't that something? I don't know. I just picked that up. I just, I, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Who do you think he's going to? Look, uh, Saul, you have to understand something. Saul actually is a picture of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going gonna, is gonna to be fighting against the Islams. Against Islam. I mean, people think there's going to be this one government of the world. No, no, no. He said... It's not, it's not a, a one world government. It's one government that will be upon all. Okay? It doesn't mean one guy can take all under control. There's going to be other nations, but they'll be, he'll be up at the top with the one government that's going to be working with those nations, telling them basically moving them all. We have that right now. Uh, just so you know, we're the head of an organization called NATO. And uh, what we're doing right now is we're uh, making all the other countries that are partners in NATO suffer for uh, what we decide. I don't know if you've noticed that, but that's what's happening in Europe right now. Sooner or later, it's going to change. It's going to turn. But Saul, Saul turned around, took the kingdom. These are his enemies against these kings and against the Philistines. And whithersoever he turned himself, he vexed them. Okay, He's, they got problems. Uh, and he gathered an host and smote the Amalekites. He's, this is now a, becoming a campaign uh, to try and uh, restore Israel when the judges, through the days of the judges, they did not. And he gathered an host and he smote the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of them that spoiled them. Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan, Ishua, Ishua, and Melchizedek, Melchizedek, 
And the names of his two daughters were these. The name of the firstborn was Mirab. And the name of the younger, Michal. And the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam. Okay, now, I don't know if you picked up on something about Saul, but Saul is monogamous right here. Look, it's like this. He's got, you got two commandment plates. One commandment plate is about the Lord, how you treat the Lord. The other commandments, the last six commandments, are about how you treat men. Okay? David was good with the four commandments on how he treated God. He, he wavered on the others. Saul is great with, he's good with the one commandment that is with men, but he's not good with the second commandment. He looks good in front of men. He, he seems to be men-pleasing. But here's the problem. He's not a pleaser of God. Where David was. And Jonathan. Jonathan's a, a pleaser of God. Uh, so he announces his kids and who they are, and it says uh, he had a wife, and her name was uh, Hinoam, and, the, and she's the daughter of a, a Hymias, and the name of the captain of the host was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. And Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, uh, was the son of Abiel. And there was a sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. So Saul understands this. He's now got a battle. He even had 600 men. He needs the best. i got to have the best around me. So you know what he's going to do? Every time he sees somebody that, hey, where's that? Look at that kid. I think I got anybody down there. Look at that. Yeah, we got this guy. He's about 200 pounds. He, he's uh, real fast. And everything. I want that guy. So Saul's now going to recruit the best people. Why? He's the king. You know why else? I mean, you would say, yeah, I want the best people around me. No, because God told him that's the kind of king you're going to get. You're going to get a selfish man that just wants everything. And that's what he got out of him. You got a selfish man who starts to indulge more to himself, protecting himself, worried about himself. I mean, he's a guy who uh, is going to fight from the rear. He's going to probably uh, double his staff if he gets into a battle. Uh, he's not going to be out there in the front. He's going to be one of those guys that's in the back. Thank the Lord for a guy like Jonathan who will break forth and go forward and go without the king. You need people like that once in a while. We just, it, 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 Saul, uh, you, you'd get no advancement. He would move on uh, having to, like he did last time. And when he does, believe me, he will do it without thinking. Jonathan cut off the, he cut off the momentum and the forward progress of the enemy. And then, once Saul saw that there was something there and he had the advantage, then he got into the fight. But if, when it was an uphill battle and they saw the two pointed rocks and no way to pass, Saul's hiding in the back with his stuff. We're dealing with lazy Saul. And a man who will not engage the enemy. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for uh, good teaching. I thank you, Lord God, for uh, getting to see it, Lord Father, and, and seeing what that pass was. I, I don't know how many times, you know, hearing about it and not thinking about it. And then later on in the 1960s, uh, another general used the same pass during the Six Days War, and that was the area of Sharon. And thank you, Lord, that we get to see these things and we see the Bible open up even in modern times. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us today, and thank you for uh, getting a lot done today in this book in an hour. We thank you. We love you, Lord. Just ask you to get this to our heart and hear our prayers for the healing of our people. We thank you, Lord. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Colonel Peterson. Andy's here. <laughs> he says, hey, Andy. Teresa's on. Hi, Teresa.